Welcome to Lecture 7 for BIB 201 Bible Doctrines 1. This lecture will cover the doctrine of angelology, or the study of angels. Now before we get into the actual discussion of what angels are, we must begin by discussing creation. The philosophy of the world is to believe in the existence of everything coming from nothing. But the philosophy of a theist is to believe in the existence of everything from something. This shows us, number one, that belief in creation is founded on faith. Hebrews 11.3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, we must remember, though, that this faith is not a blind faith. Faith is the substance or foundations of things that we've hoped for and the evidence of things we have not seen. While faith is our foundation, it is still based off of observable facts. Secondly, disbelief in creation is connected to spiritual ignorance. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says that the natural man cannot understand the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. The word discerned there means that one must investigate it. Therefore, some things can only be determined based off of spiritual investigation. And if one is not saved, then this is not possible. In fact, Luke 16.31 declares that some people would not even believe the word of God if someone came back from the dead and preached it to them himself. When it comes to creation, there are two types in which we must discuss. The first is known as immediate creation. In the Greek, it's the expression ex nihilo, which literally means out of nothing. Immediate creation is the immediate and instantaneous bringing about of the whole visible and invisible universe without the use of pre-existing materials or secondary causes. This type of creation can be seen in Genesis 1 verse 1. The second type of creation is known as mediate creation. Mediate creation is the bringing about of creation through the shaping, adapting, combining, and transforming of existing materials. The most popular form of immediate creation can be found in Genesis 2, verse 7, where the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living being. This was immediate creation. Now, there are some questions that we must consider concerning creation. The first question is this. Who created the universe? The answer to this question is the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, all three were active agents in the creation of the universe. The second question is, why did God create the universe and man? The answer to this is, it was created for the glory of God. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And thirdly, in Genesis chapter 1, what does the word day mean? The Hebrew word for day is the word yom. Now this is an ambiguous term, which either means a 24-hour period, or it can refer to a long unknown period of time, as in the phrase, the day of the Lord and the day of judgment. With that in mind, let's look at letter D, the biblical methods of interpreting Genesis 1 verse 1. The first method is called the progressive view. This view advocates that the translation of the word day in Genesis 1 should be as a period of or an age of time. The progressive view allows for what is called the geological formations. Their view would interpret Genesis 1 verses 1 through 31 thusly. 
In Genesis 1-1, they believe this is the original creation. And then verse 2, they say that is a description of the original creation. And then verses 3 through 31, they would define that as completion of the original creation over a long, unknown period of time, possibly millions or billions of years. Now let's look at some objections to the progressive view. The first objection is that the phrase evening and morning used throughout Genesis 1 denotes a 24-hour day and not a long period of time. And secondly, the establishment and example of the Sabbath day demonstrates seven literal 24-hour days. To be able to rephrase this, in Exodus 20, the Lord said because he created the universe in six days and rested on the seventh, we should work for six days and rest on the seventh. If those days are to be interpreted according to the progressive view, that would mean we should work for six long periods of time and then take off one long period of time. But that does not line up with the Exodus 20 account of the six literal days of work and the seventh literal day of a Sabbath. The second biblical method of interpreting Genesis 1-1 is known as the restitution, catastrophe, or gap theory. Letter A. This view assumes an unknown period of time existing between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. This view believes that the original creation of Genesis 1-1 was complete and perfect, but then rendered chaos by some catastrophe. Now, this chaos is said to either be the fall of Satan or a pre-Adamic race. Now, many advocate that original creation was either for the angels or for another race of mankind until some rebelled and then God recreated it for us. Secondly, they believe that the word was in Genesis 1-2 and the earth was without form and void is better translated as became without form and void. Thirdly, they purport that the existence of fossils and the timing of the fall of Satan are said to have transpired during this time. In fact, this view was advocated by the great theologian C.I. Schofield in his first Bible edition. However, it was later removed in his second edition once he had better understanding and changed his mind. And fourthly, they believe that the phrase without form and void, when used in other portions of Scripture, refers to judgment. Their argument is that since the context of Isaiah and Jeremiah refer to judgment, then this may be a way to interpret Genesis 1 as well. Interestingly, this is probably their strongest argument for this view, but we will talk in a second about the objections to this. So before we get to the objections, let's look at letter B. In this view, Genesis 1 verses 1 through 31 are translated thusly. They believe Genesis 1-1 is the cosmos. Secondly, they see Genesis 1-2 being chaos. And then thirdly and lastly, they look at verses 3-31 through of Genesis 1 as another cosmos from the chaos. Now there are several objections to the gap theory. The first objection is that the word was in Genesis 1-2 is only translated became 1% of the time throughout the Old Testament. To put this in perspective, the Hebrew word translated was here, the word in Hebrew hayah, is used 3,533 times in the Old Testament. And of those 3,533 times, only about 1% could be supported in the context of being translated as became. The second objection to this view is that the Hebrew word for form simply means shapeless. The word itself does not imply destruction, 
even though the context of Isaiah and Jeremiah may imply it. Thirdly, the Lord declared all of creation good at the end of the sixth day. Therefore, Satan's fall was most likely after this. And fourthly and lastly, the New Testament declares that Adam was the first person to die and not a pre-Adamic race. And the third and final biblical method of interpreting Genesis 1 is known as the actual day view. Letter A. This view advocates one week of creation consisting of six literal, solar, 24-hour days. In this view, they believe that creation occurred around 4004 BC. This date was advocated by the theologian named Usher. Not that Usher, this Usher. However, the greatest objection to this view is the evidence of the various ages. And our last topic underneath the section of creation is the places in creation for the geological formations. Interestingly, geologists and evolutionists reason in a circle concerning their dating of creation. Some will say that the fossils will date the rocks, but then turn around and also say that the rocks date the fossils. So then, according to the three biblical methods of interpreting Genesis, where would those views see the geological formations? Well, first, number one, the progressive and restitution views have these existing prior to the recreation of the world in Genesis 1, verses 2 through 31. And then secondly, some assume their existence as a result of the curse at the fall. And thirdly and lastly, the one to which I believe, is that others advocate their existence as a result of the flood. This view would mean that the fact that there are fossils all around the world is due to a massive upheaval of earth during the flood when God sent rains from above and below the earth. This massive formation of the earth and rocks and even the plates would have caused thousands upon millions of animals to be buried and instantly fossilized. So now that we have finished our discussion on creation, let's look at Roman numeral 2, angels. Let's begin by answering the question, do angels exist? So let's discuss their reality. Number one, the Old Testament clearly teaches the existence of angels. Three passages in particular that discuss them is Genesis 3, Genesis 16, and Isaiah 6. Secondly, not only did the Old Testament teach their existence, Christ taught their existence as well. He did so in several passages in the New Testament, particularly, obviously, in the Gospels. And thirdly, both Paul and Peter taught the existence of angels. One passage in particular is 1 Peter 3, verse 22, where Peter declared, "...who is gone into heaven, and who is on the right hand of God?" angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Now that we've answered the first question about the existence of angels, let's look at letter B. From where did angels come? What is their origin? The first thing that we should take note of is that angels were created by God. One passage in particular that discusses this is Nehemiah 9 verse 6. Here it says, You, even you, are Lord alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that are therein, and you preserve them all, and the host of heaven worships you. That host there is referring to the angels. Secondly, Angels were created before the world was formed. We know this by cross-referencing Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2 with Job 38 verses 4 and 7. The Lord says in Job 38, 
Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The Lord declared to Job that before the foundation of the earth was laid, the angels were already created because they sang for joy at their foundation. And thirdly, there were many angels created by God. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 22 says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. Now that we know that angels are real and they were created before the foundation of the earth was formed, let's look at letter C. What are angels? What is their nature? The first thing that we should take note of is number one. They are spirit beings. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 it says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvations. Angels are spirits. Secondly, angels are incorporeal, yet they can appear in human form. If you remember back to the theology proper section, we learn that incorporeal means they do not have a body. However, there are several instances in the Bible where they temporarily manifested themselves in human form. Number three, angels are beings of great might and power. We know this from Matthew 28, where it says that suddenly there was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. Then he rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. This is just a small glimpse into the might and power of angels. Fourthly, they are also beings of great knowledge. However, we should remember they are not omniscient. They do not know everything. However, they do have incredible knowledge and wisdom. Number five, angels also differ in rank and order. The first group of angels that we find described in the Bible are known as cherubim. Or, in the Hebrew, it's cherubim. Now, they are usually seen as guardians of God's throne. The most prominent and popular passage in the Bible with the cherubim is in Genesis chapter 3. Here we find that after Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, a cherubim was placed there, or technically a cherub, since it was one of them, was placed at the garden entrance with a flaming sword that would have killed anyone who tried to enter. Then letter B, the second group of angels are known as seraphim or seraphim. They are usually concerned with worship and holiness of God. We find these angels in Isaiah chapter 6 seen around the throne with six wings, two covering their face, two covering their feet, and two flying while they praised the holiness of God. The final order of angels is known as the archangel. The title archangel implies a position of leadership over all the other angels. They are very much like a militaristic general since they are over all of God's army, the angels. Secondly, Michael is the only one specifically named in the scripture as an archangel. In fact, only three angels are mentioned in our canon of scripture. Michael... Gabriel, and Lucifer. Gabriel is named, but never designated as an archangel. He actually appears more as an, as an individual who delivers news. Lucifer is also mentioned, and even though some people believe he could have been the chief of the archangels, this is unlikely since he is described as being a cherub in Ezekiel 28. Now that we know a little bit more about the nature of the angels, let's answer the question, what do angels do? 
What is their mission and what is their work? Number one, one way that we see angels is in heaven praising and worshiping God. We see this in two passages in particular, Revelation 5 and Revelation 7. Secondly, they are also seen on earth doing various activities. Letter A, they may guide the believer. We see this in Acts chapter 8 where we read, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And if you've read the story, you know that the Lord, through an angel, sent Philip to preach the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch. And most likely, that Ethiopian eunuch brought the gospel back to Africa and began spreading it in that continent. Secondly, they may cheer and strengthen God's people. We see this in the scripture in Matthew 4 when the angels ministered to the Lord himself. 1 Kings chapter 19, and we've already mentioned this verse, Hebrews 1 verse 14, that declares they are all ministering spirits sent to minister for those who will inherit salvation. Letter C, they may defend, protect, and deliver the believer. We have all heard the story of Daniel 6, where he is thrown into the lion's den. In this passage, we discover that an angel shut the mouths of the lions. Now, this is not a guarantee that every time a Christian is thrown into a situation like this, that an angel will deliver them. That is why in this section, it says they may defend, protect, and deliver the believer. But even if they do not, as the three Hebrew boys said, we should still follow the one true God. Then letter D, they will accompany Christ at his second coming. According to 2 Thessalonians 1, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. One day the Lord is going to come back to the earth and his angels are going to accompany him. And the final question that we will answer for this section that's going to lead perfectly to the next topic is, are some angels bad? Obviously, we know the answer is yes. So let's discuss their fall. Number one, the timing of the fall. Now, the gap, or also known as the catastrophe theory, believes that Satan and his angels fell sometime between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. But... Other theories advocate that their fall was somewhere between Genesis 1.31 and Genesis 3, verse 1. And while there may be some debate on when they fell, we all know that the cause of their fall was their pride. And this fall resulted in two things in particular. The first is that they all lost their holiness. Satan and every angel who fell with him lost their holiness. In addition to that, letter B, we find out from Scripture that some are held in chains while others are free to fight against God and humans. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but threw them down into Tartarus and delivered them to be kept in chains of darkness until judgment. Jude verse 6 says, And he has kept with eternal chains in darkness for the judgment of the great day, the angels who did not keep their own position, but deserted their proper dwelling. And then lastly, in Revelation chapter 12 says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail, and there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to earth and his angels with him. 
So then what was that abomination that they committed after their fall to cause some angels to be chained in darkness until the day of judgment? Well, some believe that this can be found by going to Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, the Bible talks about the sons of God seeing the daughters of men that they were well-pleasing and took them wives and had children with them. Letter A. In comparing Genesis 6 verses 4 to Job 1 verse 6, some believe that the sons of God were fallen angels. If this interpretation is correct, that would mean that fallen angels married human women, had sex with them, and then had children. But there are those that do not agree with this view. So let's look at two other options to interpret Genesis chapter 6. Some believe that from the context of Genesis 4 through 6, the sons of God were the godly line of Seth in Genesis 4. So the sons of God would be the godly line of Seth, and the daughters of men would be the ungodly line of Cain. This view believes that that is what caused God to be so angry that he began to destroy the earth. And the third and final view concerning how to interpret Genesis 6 is that some believe that since Christ declared that angels cannot have sexual relations, there are those that believe that these were literal men possessed by some fallen angels. So this view would say that yes, the sons of God were fallen angels who saw the daughters of men, but since they clearly are spirit beings and not able to have relations with a human, they possessed men to try to barter that experience. And the final topic underneath the study of angelology is Satan. Now, there are many places that will actually divide this out into its own doctrinal topic called Satanology. However, for the scope of this course, we're going to include it all together. But before we get into the discussion of a biblical view of Satan, let's begin by talking about three errors concerning Lucifer. The first error is believing that there is no personal devil. In fact, the Bible clearly teaches there is a real Lucifer, a real devil, a real Satan. And, letter A, we know that he is a sinner. 1 John 3 verse 8 says, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Why? For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Not only is he a sinner, according to John 8, 44, he is a murderer and a liar. The third way that we know that the devil is real is because he possesses all three elements of personality. The first is that he has intellect. In Job chapter 1, the Lord mentions to Satan about the man Job. Satan responds that he knew exactly who Job was and reasoned that Job's motives were impure in serving him. This showed because of all the people on the earth at that time, Satan must have had and still has incredible intellect because he knows who people are. Secondly, not only does Satan have intellect, he has emotion. We can see this clearly in Revelation 12, where it says, Woe for the earth and for the sea, because the devil has come down to you having great anger. In Luke, Satan has a desire to do something to Peter. And in Revelation, we find that Satan is angry over being kicked out of heaven and will take it out on the earth. These examples of in Luke and Revelation show that Satan has the element of personality known as emotion. And thirdly and lastly, he possesses the element of personality known as a will. This is also called volition. We can see this clearly as well in Isaiah 14, where he said in his heart, 
I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. Five times in these two verses, Satan says, I will. He had a desire. He had volition. He has all three elements of personality. In addition to the error of believing that there is no personal devil, another error is believing that if the devil does exist, he is an ugly, miltonic creation. The idea that Satan is an ugly red monster with horns and a pitchfork came from the writings of a man by the name of John Milton in his book, Paradise Lost. This was his personification of Satan's actions and not a way to try to describe his real appearance. In spite of that, even to this day, many, many people believe that is what Satan looks like. However, the Bible describes that he is an angel of light and appears in a beautiful way to deceive the nations. And the third and final error concerning Satan is believing that his sole residence is in hell. 1 Peter 5 verses 8 and 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan is alive and real, and he is walking to and fro on the earth, not in hell, trying to destroy God's people. Now let's look at letter B, the names given to Satan in the Bible. Number one, Satan's proper name is Lucifer, translated as light bearer. In Isaiah 14 verse 12 it says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? The name of Satan is Lucifer. In a second, we'll find out Satan is a title or name to describe his adversarial relationship with the Lord and with us. Secondly, he is also called the devil. In Matthew 4 verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. In the Greek, the word devil, diablos, means accuser. This word is used the most in reference to Satan, to Lucifer, because it is used 33 times. This shows that one of his main duties, one of his main actions, is accusing us before God. Thirdly, he is also called Satan. In 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14 it says, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. The word Satan in Greek means adversary. And the context in 2 Corinthians 11 pertains to false teachers whose message seems good, but in reality is evil. Now when this word is used of Peter in Matthew 16, 23, where Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan, the general definition of the word adversary is preferable instead of those who believe Peter may have been possessed by the devil himself. The better way to understand that verse is since Peter was trying to resist the crucifixion, he was being an adversary to God's plan. So Jesus had to put him in his place. Fourthly, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 15 calls the devil Belial. In this verse it says, What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? The word Belial literally means worthless. This is Paul's way of saying that the devil, Lucifer, is worthless. And fifthly and lastly, the devil is called Beelzebub. This means chief of devils or prince of demons. Matthew 12, 24 says, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. In this passage, 
Jesus was being accused of being the devil himself, or at least the power behind him being the devil himself, and the fact that he was able to cast out demons. Letter C. Now that we've examined the names given to Satan, let's look at the titles given to Satan. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, he is called the God of this world. Here it says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Not only is he called the God of this world, he is also called the Prince of this world. John 14.30 says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. And thirdly and lastly, he is called the prince of the power of the air. In Ephesians 2 verse 2, Paul said, In which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So then, if we know the names and titles given to him, where did Satan come from? Interestingly, his unfallen state is clearly described in Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 15. Here it says, You, Satan, were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. And as we've already discussed, the fall of Satan is described specifically in Isaiah 14 verses 12 through 15 and Ezekiel 28 verses 15 through 17. His fall is when his pride got to him and he decided that he will do things against the Lord. Letter E. Let's talk about the nature and sphere of Satan. Number one, we find from the Bible clearly that Satan is wicked. In 1 John 5 verse 18 it says, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one or the wicked one does not harm him. Secondly, he is also mighty. So mighty that in Jude verse 9, the Bible says that Michael dared not bring an accusation against Satan, but instead rebuked him in the name of the Lord. Michael realized, even as an archangel, that he should appeal to a higher power than try to fight Satan one-on-one. -on -one. And thirdly, he is shrewd and cunning. He is so shrewd and cunning that Paul says in Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Why? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Fourthly, Clearly, Satan tempts mankind. We see this in Genesis, Matthew, and in 1 Thessalonians. Fifthly, he oppresses Christians. He tries to put us down and stop us at every corner. Sixthly, he accuses man before God. Just like he did with Job, he does with us and brings accusations against us, but thankfully, Jesus is at the right hand of the throne of God, making intercession for us. Seventhly, 
Satan blinds men to the truth. In 2 Corinthians 4, it says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, whose is the image of God. And lastly, number eight, Satan opposes the word of God. In a parable that Jesus delivered in Mark 4, clearly he describes that the devils are the birds seen in that parable who come and steal away the seed of the word of God so it cannot be implanted in the hearts of people. Finally, let's talk about the destiny of that wicked, terrible Satan. Number one. We do know that Christ bruised Satan on the cross, but his final defeat will come at the end of the millennium. According to Revelation 20, this is when Satan will be cast into the lake of fire to never be able to deceive the nations again. What a glorious day that will be. That brings us to the end of Lecture 7 for BIB 201, Bible Doctrines 1.